everyone, this is a Barclay Damon Live broadcast. You're listening to The Cannabis Counselor and I'm your host, Elise Bergio. Let's get into it. What's up everybody? This is episode eight of The Cannabis Counselor. We're here today with Senator Jeremy Cooney from the 56th District. He is a New York State Senator and also the co-chair of the Marijuana Task Force for Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Caucus. We're gonna be talking about a lot today. The vote has passed. And so Senator Cooney and I are gonna dive into what the opposition was, how we're going to move forward from this day on, and really just the next few timelines and processes and, and hopefully we get a clear picture on what's to come. Tune in. Senator Cooney, thank you so much for coming on the Cannabis Counselor podcast. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me and glad to be here. Feeling feeling good, a little anxious uh, with the season that we're in with the budget, but uh, feeling really good about this legislation that we just passed. I know. Thank you for carving out the time. It is obviously so crazy right now. And that legislation, it passed last week, uh, signed by the governor on Wednesday the 31st. It's just momentous. Very exciting. How is the temperature in Albany right now? Is everyone Is everyone hyped up? Yeah, I would say so. It's definitely an energizing piece of legislation. And, you know, I'm a new legislator, so I always say this, that those of us who came into the legislature, I think we played a major role in getting this uh, piece of legislation over the finish line. That said, we certainly stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us and have been fighting this fight for years and years and years. You know, my colleague, Senator Liz Kruger, the sponsor of the bill in the Senate, um, has kind of given so much time over the last five years. Um, and, and she put all her chips into the middle of the table uh, this session. So I, I was glad to, to play a role and just to help her and so many others like Leader Crystal People Stokes um, make sure that the right bill was passed, not just a bill, but the mm-hmm. right type of bill. And it's so important too, right? I mean, the Marijuana Regulation Taxation Act has been put into the legislature since 2013. And it's nice to see that progression happen. And, you know, a lot of times those bills end up falling because a new bill is put in or a negotiated bill is is put forth. And so it is, it's it's really, it's, it's nice to see that that bill got its merit at the time that it was supposed to. And now you're a co-chair for the Marijuana Task Force for Black, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, and Asian Caucus. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Awesome. So we, we formed a task force really at the end of last year going into this session because of the type of membership that our caucus had elected that was very outwardly pro-legalization for recreational adult use cannabis. So. Mm-hmm. We knew that really the fight wasn't about legalizing, it was a fight around social justice. And so, totally. um, So, Assemblywoman uh, Mikhail Solaj appointed myself um, as the co chair, the Senate co chair, um, with, of course, our legendary fighter, uh, Assembly Majority Leader uh, Crystal People Stokes, as the other, the Assembly co chair. And together, we chaired this task force uh, within the the Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian caucus. Very exciting. So now give us us some of the scoops. What was going on during this period where you're on the floor, the assembly is speaking, the the Senate is talking? What were some of the opposition components to this bill? Obviously, we could talk all day about, we will, we'll get into the social equity and the things that make New York's bill a lot more progressive than any other state we've seen. But what were some of the, the issues that you guys were combating on the floor in real time? So I, I think for me, um, there were two sticky points. And again, I'll, I'll note that I'm sure that there were plenty of arguments that came before I entered the Senate in January. Mm-hmm. But the two sticky points that I think have kind of carried over from past legislative sessions are really around uh, public safety, specifically narrowing in on the vehicle traffic law uh, issues, uh, making sure that um, cars and inhibited drivers or impaired drivers uh, were safely on our roadways in New York. And then the other sticky issue was really around the social equity component and Mm -hmm. how we take what we anticipated would be a large amount of tax revenue, new tax revenue, to the state and reinvested those dollars back into the community. You know, over the years, there's actually, we've actually come closer 
uh, when I say we, I mean the legislature, the assembly and the Senate and the executive, the governor's office have come closer mm -hmm. to that commitment that some or all of these dollars need to be reinvested into the people of this state. Yep. But the devil's in the details, as you know, it's kind of, was there gonna be a social equity fund that had a fixed amount? Was there gonna be a dollar amount that would be tied to the amount of revenue earned by the state, which is of course where we ended up. So there was some, there was some differences there. Um, so those are the two issues I would say that really came to the forefront um, over the last two months. You know, it's so, it, I've listened a lot to the opposition because I think you learn the most from what people don't like about the bill because I, I can personally get carried away in the terms of like social justice progression, like moving forward, this is what we're supposed to happen. But like some of the, you know, trepidation, the people who are nervous, you do have to take into account. And I think it's so interesting, the driving while impaired argument, because it's not like there's an answer, right? And so you've got these states, 15 states ahead of New York State, who have had time. I mean, you know, Oregon, Colorado, I think was in 2014 when they legalized. So we're talking now close to about to be seven years worth of legalization. And we're still not comfortable with the impaired while driving uh, techniques and tests and things like that, because there isn't technically a device that will tell you when it was ingested, consumed, or inhaled. Um, but I thought an amazing counterpoint to that from Assemblywoman Krista People Stokes when she was uh, when she was talking about this was the prohibition happened it ended in 1933 and the breathalyzer didn't come out until 1953 so 20 years later and it's one of those I think really uh, interesting issues of you almost have to be uncomfortable or comfortable with the uncomfortable fact that you're not going to have a device right away we have to put tax dollars to teams and research in order to really understand how that's going to work. I think it'll happen. It's just, it's interesting that it's still taking this long and it just goes to show how difficult that process is. And, and to your point, we did do that, exactly that in the mm -hmm. legislation. We funded a study uh, for that technology to be developed. And look, I think, I think here's the practical reality. Those of us who have worked in the private sector know how this works, right? Mm -hmm. So we just, we just onboarded or put online a state of 19 million people mm -hmm. who are going to be able to participate in an adult use recreational marijuana marketplace, right? So there's going to be a lot of interest and quite, you know, I think a lot of sales that, that will result mm -hmm. from that. So now we have every technology company in this type of space rushing uh, to come up with this device or test because mm -hmm. they know that local law enforcement, uh, state law enforcement is going to be looking for to, to purchase this product. I mean, yep. it's, it, in some ways, it's kind of like what we saw with the vaccine early on, right? We knew that we had this terrible COVID-19 virus spreading across the world. And there was almost like an arms race between the major pharmaceutical companies. Exactly. Right. To come up with a solution. And thank God they did. Right. Between Pfizer, Moderna and, and J and J. But, you know, th that's how we got to that's how the market incentivized us. Of getting course. That's, that's the same it's thing. having a monopoly. It's it, having a monopoly. Right. And, and, and the same thing is going to it's going to incentivize the marketplace to develop this type of technology, I would say fairly quickly. I mean, think about it just purely from the capital capitalist point of view, right? I mean, every shareholder and major technology company is going to want a piece of this, right? So they're oh, going to absolutely. put resources behind that research. So I, I think we'll get there, but the point is not lost on me that you made earlier, mm -hmm. which is that you know, impaired driving or um, you know, when you're when you see a car that that really isn't safe on the road there should be an opportunity to get that car off the road, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's some sort of marijuana product, whether it's overdosing on prescription drugs, right? It, it could be, there's a number of things. It's not just alcohol or marijuana, right? There's a number, it could be a sleepy driver, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of factors that 
should empower our law enforcement departments to be able to keep our roads safe. And I think this was actually an interesting issue from a representation standpoint. If you look at the the democracy, D lowercase d, uh, within our two chambers, right? It was the the urban or New York City centric uh, proponents of the bill often arguing with their Democratic colleagues, big D, Democratic colleagues mm -hmm. um, in suburban towns or in upstate New York, which I represent in the city of Rochester. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there was a thought because we are a very car, you know, car driven economy. We, we get yeah. cars to get a, go to Wegmans or go to where have, where have you. And so for us, it's much more of an issue than someone who consumes an edible and then gets on a subway and gets back home safely. So right. you know, that I understand the uh, reluctance to just kind of go along to get along with a lot of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. That said, I think we had some really important conversations and some difficult ones and that we came to a good result where we, the legislation that did pass, in addition to the study and the research for this uh, device also outlined a number of guardrail uh, pieces of, of language so that we don't go out of control, that, so that law enforcement mm -hmm. is empowered to get impaired drivers off the road, but not take it further and unjustly prosecute or arrest individuals for their use of their consumption of marijuana. And we also funded more uh, uh, DRE officers, uh, right, drug recognition experts, mm -hmm. uh, to, so that they can be more trained and be ready to respond to what we assume will be an increased usage. But, but you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop myself before I keep on rambling on here. It's not necessarily an increased usage because right. the reality is New Yorkers are already consuming this substance. We are just I, taking it out of the back alley and bringing it into the front of the marketplace, right? And, and allowing it to be sold legally and safely. So I've had that conversation quite a bit, I feel like recently, which is, you know, why should marijuana be legal, right? That's That's kind of been the question, I think, that a lot of people who, you know, aren't necessarily in favor of legalization. That's their first question. Like, why do we need it? And it's always, in my opinion, a public health issue. It's not like nobody's doing it, right? Like, I mean, I think it's fair to say most people in their lifetime have done it. Um, but, you know, it's really, people want to know where they're getting it from. They want to know it's, they want to know it's tested, that it is not accessible to their children. Like there's all these safeguards in place, which is really important. And we sh we really you know, take that that's what you need to take pride in for this for this bill is the fact that like it is regulating a system that's already there and also including people who are currently in it to go legal for you know for the foreseeable future and incentivize them for that process. And and it's it's truly just building off of that point, it's truly a rising tide lifts mm -hmm. all because when we do that, when we take the, the market right now for cannabis and moving into a legalized and safe use. Not only do we ensure quality, right? And make sure that the product that is actually being purchased is safe for consumption, but we also empower economic benefit back into the communities which have been ravaged by this war on drugs over the past few decades. And we allow local municipalities to benefit from that. So it's really a win-win. The state wins because we're able to realize some new revenue sources and reinvest it back into distressed neighborhoods and communities. The local municipality wins, right? That could be a city, that could be a town, a village, because they get a certain percentage, um, depending on how it's broken out, but upwards of 4% uh, back locally stays. Um, so for that could go to schools, that could go to road improvements, can go to pro youth development programs. Um, and the community, all of us as New Yorkers benefit because we are no longer incentivizing or perpetuating an illegal drug trade on our streets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I think that transition us perfectly into our next point, which is expungement, right? That's kind of been a really progressive and pioneer component of this bill. Um, and I've actually gotten a few emails asking, hey, when does that process happen? What's the fee going to look like? Is there any insight into when we'll start seeing that 
happen? I know right now um, it's currently not available. Do we know what it, it kind of will pan out to be? So a little bit of to be determined, but let me just comment quickly on on overall the process because this mm -hmm. is a this is a big component of our legislation and something that we fought very hard for with the marijuana task force within the Black Puerto Rican Hispanic and Asian caucus, mm -hmm. um, and and that is not just expungement but an automatic expungement, right? Mm -hmm. and so that individuals who have been either incarcerated or released for low level drug offenses in New York um, would have their records expunged, which is really significant when mm -hmm. you think about these charges. So let's say you were arrested for a, a, a low level possession charge. We're not talking about you know, drug kingpins, that's a RICO charge at the federal level, that's, that's mm -hmm. still on the books, right? But for a low level drug possession charge, you are that even if you have, you know, served your time or paid your fine, um, that stays with you on your record. So every single time you apply for a job, it could be 10 years later, you still have to mark that. And that, and that yep. really impedes successful reintegration into society and from an employment standpoint and providing for your family. And Absolutely. so by automatically expunging that, and I think that that will, they, the, the legislation builds in a little bit of a buffer time up to two years um, so that, you know, the, the, the administrative paperwork will be able to, to be underway. You do not have to go back to court and petition. Right, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. We're taking these financial. That is a barriers. huge deal. Right, because so, you know, cl clog our clock, clog our court system with all this. Oh, absolutely. So let me ask you this: So you're not going to have, like, say, I had um, been released from prison. I have only a marijuana charge. I don't have any gun charges tacked on with it. It's simply a possession or use charge, right? Is what we're talking Correct. for expungement purposes. And, and just state level charges, not federal charges. That's and state level charges. Yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't have to sign anything. I wouldn't have to fill out any documentation. It would be automatically expunged just through the system. Is that like, so I understand, I'm interested. Yeah, I believe that you are correct. Um, I, I don't wanna, don't quote me on that. No, I'm not quoting. A, 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 lot, a, lot of, a lot of this will be, and I think this is actually a good point to raise. Mm -hmm. A lot of these um, process points will be determined by this new office of cannabis management who mm -hmm. will have oversight, not just of the licensing and the business side of the equation, but also on carrying out and executing the public policy components of um, the MRTA legislation that you referenced earlier um, to fruition. So there may be some timeline and uh, process standpoints, but the goal would be the, at this point, to identify anyone who still has these rec uh, on the record or is mm -hmm. currently incarcerated, again, just on state level offenses, and then be able to find ways to, to help them. So we are working very closely, we, I say collectively, the legislature is working very closely with a lot of the um, legal aid societies or uh, legal service projects in across upstate and downstate, uh, defenders projects in, in, in the five boroughs, right? To make sure that their clients have all this information. I would yep. say, like, I think we'll have more in 30 days. I think that's, that's a, great. A, a fair assessment, yeah. What, um, what I think is great already is that the Office Cannabis Management's website already launched, launched uh, this past Friday, I think, um, which is super, expedited in my opinion i was incredibly impressed um but i think just wrap up our last question you know i love your passion for social equity and the inclusion how did you get motivated to, to join in on, on that task force and what kind of drives you as a legislator to keep moving forward with these ideals sure well i i ran for the state senate in 2018 so this was one of this was before the democrats had taken uh, the majority representation in the Senate. But it was a big talking point that marijuana legalization, you mentioned that, you know, it started in 2013 with the legislation that had been entered. But this would actually come to fruition in 2018 if we elected a major Democratic majority in the state Senate. So True. This, was, this was part of my platform and running. And I'll tell you what, I mean, you know, this is, I've learned more about marijuana in the last, you know, couple of years than mm -hmm. I ever cared to know. Um, yep. And it's a fascinating industry. Uh, and from, you know, I'm a student of public policy. I'm an economics guy. So that just intellectually motivates me. But there's two things that I think 
I think really pushed me to get involved and to and to ask to the co-chair of this task force um, with the majority leader. One, I, I love her. I love Crystal People Stokes. She's an outspoken mm -hmm. champion and no one's going to get in her way. And she was only going to pass the right legislation for her people in Buffalo and for the rest of New York. So mm -hmm. to be able to learn from and partner with an incredible leader like uh, the majority leader and from Senator Kruger, who I absolutely adore mm -hmm. in, in the state Senate because she just it has a way of speaking clearly and, and genuinely to, to uh, opposition as well yeah. as her colleagues. So to really learn from these two incredible women and of course following the leadership from uh, Andrea Stewart Cousins, our majority leader, it just was a, a great opportunity for me as a first year legislator. That said, uh, I am an upstate guy. I, I am from Rochester. I love Rochester. And I, it breaks my heart that 16, you're 16 times more likely to be arrested for a low level drug offense if you are black than if you are white in Monroe County. That is really? the reality right that now. That is a very Monroe. high percentage, 16, 16 times more like. I've been hearing four, black. I've been hearing six. No. 16 is insane. It, it, especially it is it gets even um crazier when you look at the percentage of our population of black to white in monroe county which is greater rochester so this is a social justice issue first and foremost for mm -hmm. me as a as a rochesterian um but i also look at it from the lens of upstate new york i am a huge proponent for how do we reinvigorate the upstate economy and i want to make sure that upstate whether it's you know uh, a farmland in my district or whether it's our our upstate big five cities uh, i want to make sure that we participate in this new economy and that could be in any level of the vertical right that could be uh mar cannabis crops that could yep. be processing that could be distribution to go from mm -hmm. jamestown to montauk right and it, it could also of course be the retail dispensary side, which we'll see the most amount of interest in. So I just wanted to make sure upstate New York had a voice in the state Senate. Because, you know, Liz Kruger, again, Senator Kruger, amazing advocate, represents the Upper East Side of Manhattan, right? right. So it's a very different lens than a city like Rochester that has that disproportionate social justice impact. And honestly, their lens is going to be mostly through retail and distribution down in, down in New York City. They're, nobody is really going to be putting processing and producing facilities, I think, there. One, cost for real estate is just way too high. And two, you know, there's, you could just, it's so much easier to get accessibility up here for, you know, local town approvals and, and buying land where you're near nobody. I mean, it's just, well, New York, New York could do vertical, vertical farming, right? Which is something I'm interested in. But yeah, you know, the price of real estate is is somewhat prohibitive unless you're like way out in, you know, Brooklyn or Staten Island. Uh, and then I also, think, yeah. but I was going to say also, don't forget that we already have somewhat of a cannabis crop industry with our hemp farmers who are already in place in mm -hmm. upstate New York who can then convert over with that THC component. So mm -hmm. in many ways we in upstate New York, not only do we have the land, but we are ready to go. We just have to, you know, switch some functionality here. Totally. I think vertical is going to come into play with micro grows. Mm. You're going to see a lot of vertical in New York with micro because they'll utilize 2,000, 1,500 square feet the correct way and, and getting how many plants you can, unless they do plant count, but usually micro grows include a square footage as opposed to a, a plant. Mm. Um, Amazing. Okay. Well, thank you so much for hopping on. This has been so fun and informative. Um, and for everyone who's listening, this podcast will launch uh, next Tuesday. So April 13th. And um, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. And let us know if there's anything new and you got to hop back on and catch everybody up. We really appreciate it. Anytime, stay involved. And if you are in upstate New York, make sure that you are getting ready because we know that this is going to be a fast moving process. Once the Office of Cannabis Management releases its process, we want to be ready. We want to be able to participate and we want to benefit our communities. So stay in touch and let us know how we can be helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. You have a great one. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. The Cannabis Counselor Podcast is available on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play. Like, follow, share, and continue to listen. Thanks.